How can you implement the Fluent Builder pattern? This is a creational design pattern that encapsulates the creation of complex objects. And by using a Fluent API, we can benefit from expressive and concise syntax. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to implement the Fluent Builder. The Fluent Builder pattern and the Fluent API's approach are somewhat related, so we are going to unpack both of these approaches inside of this video. The Builder pattern is one of the original design patterns from the Gang of Four book, called Design Patterns, and this is a creational design pattern. It's used to simplify the creation of complex objects inside of your applications, and it allows you to write cleaner and more expressive code when creating your objects by encapsulating all of the complexity inside of the builder implementation. However, the builder pattern also increases the complexity of your solution because you will have to manage the additional classes and files that represent the actual builders. And now, let's discuss the Fluent Builder pattern. Here's an example of an order builder that implements the Fluent Builder pattern. We start by creating an empty order, and then we can add additional data. For example, we can specify the order number, when it was created. We can also configure any nested types inside of an order, for example, the shipping address. And when we are satisfied with the state of our order, we can call the build method to produce an order instance. I'm going to show you how to implement the Fluent Builder approach in the practical part of this video, but first let's discuss when we should be using the Builder pattern. You can use the Fluent Builder when you need to encapsulate creation logic for complex objects. This could be your domain entities, but a Fluent Builder is also practical for report generation, and this is the approach that the Quest PDF library uses if you are familiar with that. The Fluent Builder also allows you to create immutable objects that are thread safe by design because they can't be changed after initialization. The Builder is going to contain the intermediate step, but once you produce the actual object, it cannot be changed because it's immutable. And this is a very big advantage of the Builder pattern. Another use case where the Fluent Builder is useful is inside of your tests when you need to prepare the data for a particular test. You can create objects in a different state based on the use case that you are testing, and this is very practical for unit testing. Let's also unpack what we mean when we say Fluent API. A great example of this is Link inside of C Sharp, and here's an example where I'm generating 10 random orders and then chunking them into batches of two. I'm starting from the enumerable type, and we can call the static range method to begin our Fluent API. And then we're going to continue chaining additional methods until we are satisfied with our method chain, and then we can decide to materialize the results. For example, I can call the toList method, and this will give me back my collection. I'm also combining this with the Fluent Builder in the Select method to generate the actual orders. So a Fluent API is a functional approach to writing your code where you can write a program by chaining multiple function calls one after the other. In this example, we are starting the method chain with the range function or method, followed by a call to select, and then we call the chunk, and lastly the to list method. So this is an example of what a Fluent API would look like. A very common use case for the Fluent API and the Fluent Builder approach is your dependency injection setup. So here's an example of configuring an open telemetry setup where I'm introducing open telemetry services, configuring my service name, and then I'm setting up the tracing support for my application. I can chain together multiple calls to wire up the required instrumentations, for example, for ASP.NET Core, the HTTP client, Redis, MPG SQL, and NAD Framework Core. The last method here, configuring the open telemetry exporter, could also be part of the method chain, but I decided to place it separately to make this more readable. So you can see that these patterns are commonly used inside of .NET and ASP.NET Core, so let's understand how we can build them. We're going to start with a simple example to understand the Fluent Builder pattern. So let's define an order class that's going to contain just two properties to start. The first one is going to be the order number with a get and set accessor. And then I'm going to define a date time property that is going to specify when this order was created. However, we won't be creating this order directly. What we want to do is to create an instance of an order using our builder. So for this, we're going to introduce another type that we can call the order builder. The order builder is going to contain the state that is required to instantiate an order instance. So this is going to be an order number, as well as a date time field representing when this order was created. And then we can expose some methods that are going to allow us to build our order. So first of all, I want to make the constructor of this class private so that you can create it directly. 
you have to start by calling the static factory method. This is going to give you back an instance of an order builder. Let's call this the empty method and it's just going to return a new order builder instance. And then I'm going to start exposing my methods for building the order. So all of these methods are going to return the order builder instance and we're going to modify the state of the builder. So let's say with number and then I can specify the actual number that I want my order to have. So I'm going to set the value of the number field and I can just return the current instance. Let's expose another method for the created on property and we're going to return an order builder the same as before and I will say with created on. This is going to accept a date time argument representing my created on value and I'm just going to set the created on field to this value and return the current instance. And finally, I'm going to expose another method that is going to return the order instance. And this is going to be the build method that knows how to instantiate my complex object. Now, in this example, my object isn't all that complex. And this is because I like to make these examples simple to illustrate the overall concept. So what we would do here is instantiate the order instance based on the values in the order builder. So I can set the number and create it on property from the values that I have in the order builder and return the order instance. Now let's see how we are going to use this type. So right on top, I'm going to call the order builder and the entry point is the empty method. This is going to give me back an order builder instance and I can call the with number method to specify the order number. Then I can specify when this order was created by calling the with created on method and I can specify some value here, let's say daytime UTC now to make things simple. And finally, I can call the build method, which is going to give me back the order instance. And then I can do something with my order. For example, let's just log this to the console and then let's run the application so I can walk you through what this process looks like. So our entry point is going to be the order builder and you can see that we are currently in the empty method that's going to create a new order builder instance. If we continue along, we're going to visit the individual methods in the order builder. Here we are calling the with number method, then we're calling the with created on method, and finally we can call the build method to instantiate an order. So you can see that debugging this isn't ideal because we are jumping through many methods to finally produce the order state. However, once it's done, we can create an order instance and you can see that it contains the respective values. Now I said that we could make our objects immutable, so let's go ahead and do that by making the order have init accessors instead of a setter, so this can only be called once when instantiating the object. Now I'm going to move these types into separate files, so let's move the order and order builder into their own files. Let's discuss how we could approach creating the order when it contains a nested type, and let's say that this nested type is complex, for example, like an order that contains multiple properties. So let me create another property on the order. The type is going to be an address and let's call this the shipping address. We want to manage the creation of an address through the order builder. So what we could do is expose another method. It's also going to return an order builder and let's call it with shipping address. Let's start with a simple approach where I can just specify an address instance and we would have a respective address field that we would set as part of this method and then we're going to assign this address to the order in the build step. However, this isn't really flexible and it doesn't give you a simple way to control how you're going to set the properties on the address. So an alternative approach that we could try would be to also create a respective builder for the address and let me show you what that approach would look like. I'm going to create a new class that I will call the address builder and it's going to contain the respective fields that will match the properties on my address object. I'm also going to hide the constructor of this type by making it private and the only entry point for creating an address builder would be a static method that gives you back an empty address builder instance. Then we could expose respective methods to set the required fields so let's say I have a street method that is going to set the street field and I will use it later when instantiating the address. Now let's create a few more instances of this method for the other fields that we have and then let's set the respective field. So the next method would be called city and it will set the respective property and then I'm going to update the names of the other methods that we have. So we have a zip method to set the zip code, a state method to set the state and a country method to set the country. And lastly, we need a method that's going to give us back the address instance, 
we will call this build and what it's going to do is return a new address instance and it's going to set the respective properties on the address. So we can set the street value to the street field. Then we can set the city, the zip code, the state and the country. And this will give us back our address instance. Let's go ahead and move the address builder into its own file. And then I want to show you how we're going to use the address builder from the order builder. So what I want to do is to define a private read only field there's going to be my address builder and I'm going to get this instance by instantiating an empty address builder. Then what I'm going to do in the with shipping address method, instead of taking in an address instance, I can take in an action that's going to run on the address builder. Let's just give this a simple name of action. And then inside of the method, we're going to run this action on the address builder instance and I can return the order builder back from this method. And if I go into my program file, let me show you how we would use this. So I can now call with shipping address and I can provide a delegate to configure the actual address. So I can set the street of this address to some value and then I can chain a call to city and set some value. Then I can chain a call to zip and set some value. And finally, I'm going to chain a call to country and set some value. I'm not calling the state method on purpose. And what this is going to do is it's going to set the default value for the string type in this field, which is going to be a null value. So if you want to explicitly control this, you can also introduce the concept of validation inside of your builders. And in the build method, you can check if the correct methods were called. So in this case, if the state is null, I can set some default value to the state property, for example, not applicable. And you can see that we end up with a very clean design when building the order instance. And then let me show you what this is going to look like when we run it. So we're going to start by instantiating an empty order builder and an address builder. And then we're going to call the respective methods one by one. So we are first going to land inside of the width number method where we are going to set the order number. Then we're going to set the width created on property on the order builder. And lastly, we're going to call the width shipping address, which is going to run the delegate that's going to configure the address builder. However, there's a big problem here. And that is that I forgot to set the shipping address. So let's go ahead and do that now. And how we're going to do this is by calling the build method on the address builder. So we are configuring the address builder in the call to with shipping address. And then we are using it to build an address instance in the build method of the order builder. So this allows us to configure the address builder from the API exposed by the order builder. And we can use it when we call the build order method to set the required state on the order instance. So you can see that I get back an order instance and all of these properties have the respective values. And you can also see that the state property has the default value of NA because I didn't call the state method when configuring the shipping address. So you can see how this allows us to encapsulate the creation of an address and an order behind the builder pattern and allows us to control what we can and cannot set on the respective objects. One more thing I wanted to discuss is the naming convention that you can apply here. I'm using the with property approach for all of my methods, but you can decide to use a more descriptive approach. So instead of created on, you can just say that this order should be created on the specified date. And instead of with shipping address, we can say that this order should be shipped to the specific address. The benefit is that this naming approach reads more like a sentence. So if you try to convert this into a sentence, we start with an empty order builder with a number of 10 that was created on the date time UTC now value. And this order is shipped to the specified street, city, zip and country. And finally, we're going to build the order instance. So you can see how this approach can improve readability and make it more intuitive of which methods you should be calling on the builder. And I also wanted to show you an example of how nicely the Fluent Builder pattern goes along with link method chaining. What I'm doing here is creating a range of numbers and then I'm using these numbers to produce my orders. Finally, I'm chunking these orders into batches of two before calling two lists to materialize the order. And this is actually another example of a builder. I'm running my individual steps, the range, select, and chunk methods, and finally materializing my collection by calling two lists, similar to how I'm calling the build method in the order builder.
The Fluent Builder pattern is particularly useful if you are creating a library that's going to be consumed by other developers. You want to give them a simple and expressive API that they can use to create the required objects and the Fluent Builder pattern allows you to achieve this. If you want to grab the source code for this video, you can do that by subscribing to my Patreon. Also check out my Clean Architecture and Modular Monolith courses and until next time, stay awesome.